If you enjoy this video, subscribe to Scarf and Goggles and check out our other content. John Cobb's passion for motorsport started early. In 1907, when Brooklands, the world's first purpose-built circuit, opened close to his home, the seven-year-old Cobb found the speed and the spectacle irresistible. John Cobb was hooked. Reed Railton was a naturally gifted engineer who had worked with famed Brooklands racer J.G. Parry Thomas at Leyland. He moved on to work for engineering firm Thompson & Taylor, where he designed the record-breaking Bluebird car for Malcolm Campbell, another Brooklands regular. Gentle giant John Cobb was firmly established at Brooklands by 1933, when he commissioned Reed Railton to design the ultimate Brooklands racer, the 24-litre Napier Railton. As imposing as Cobb himself, the giant silver car would go on to set the fastest ever lap at Brooklands, at an average of 143 miles per hour. However, Malcolm Campbell's latest outright world land speed record of 272 miles per hour remained out of Cobb's reach. For that challenge, he, like Campbell, would need a special car, and he knew just the man to design it. The result was the incredible twin-engined Railton Mobile Special, whose story is told elsewhere on this channel. By 1947, Cobb had raised the land speed record to almost 400 miles per hour, and he and Railton started to discuss a new challenge. The history of speed on water goes back to 1885, when a succession of steam-powered craft claimed unofficial speed records. Later attempts were gasoline-powered, often using adapted large-capacity aero engines, but it was not until 1928 that the first official record was set by American George Wood. In 1930, famed British racer Sir Henry Seagrave attempted to break the record on Lake Windermere in the north of England. On the 13th of June, Seagrave had already run Miss England 2 fast enough on his first two attempts to take the record, but elected to make a third run. When his boat capsized at full speed, Seagrave survived his injuries just long enough to learn that he had broken the record at 98.76 miles per hour and now held both the land and water records. For the next few years, American Gar Wood and Irishman K. Don regularly traded the water speed crown, until British land speed legend Sir Malcolm Campbell broke the record four times in two years with his Bluebird K3 and K4 hydroplanes. In August 1939, two weeks before the war broke out in Europe, Campbell raised the record to 141.74 miles per hour. The onset of the Second World War resulted in great advances in aero engine technology, not least of which was the rapid development of the jet engine, an idea patented in 1930, but largely undeveloped until the outbreak of war. The new power units were lightweight, powerful, and as they provided thrust without using a propeller, hydrodynamic drag would be reduced. After the war, Campbell's Bluebird K4 was converted to jet power, but the resulting craft was not a success. Meanwhile, John Cobb could see an opportunity to emulate Henry Seagrave and hold both water and land speed crowns, the undisputed fastest man on earth. Now all he needed was a boat. The constantly changing surface of water makes the world water speed record an engineering challenge like no other. For over 100 years, designers have looked towards hydroplanes to help them achieve higher and higher speeds. Unlike traditional boat hull designs, which cut through the water using their natural buoyancy to stay afloat, hydroplanes rely on water forces to lift most of the hull out of the water when at speed, 
maintaining contact at just a few points. This significantly reduces drag and greatly increases maximum speed. They effectively skim across the top of the water rather than pushing through it. Successful hydroplane designs for Campbell's Bluebird K4 and subsequent record holder Slow Motion 4 both used three planing points, arranged with two at the front of the craft and one at the rear. But with the higher speeds possible using a jet engine, Railton could see that the wide frontal area of a conventional three-pointer might cause high levels of aerodynamic lift, resulting in a backflip or blowover at speed. Noting patents and designs from America, Railton reversed the traditional configuration of the planing points. Now, a single planing shoe would support the front of the boat, with slim outriggers at the rear, providing the other two planing points. The basic shape for Cobb's Challenger was born. Aircraft manufacturer de Havilland's powerful new Ghost engine would suit the craft's layout perfectly. Railton calculated that the Ghost's 5,000 pounds of thrust should enable Cobb to achieve 250 miles per hour in the first water speed Challenger exclusively designed to use a jet engine. American Stanley Sayers had broken Malcolm Campbell's record in 1950, raising the mark to 160 miles per hour. He would raise it again before Cobb's craft was completed. Cobb may originally have set out to better Campbell's record, but he joked that with his new craft he was now leading a crusade against the Americans, and so Cobb's boat had its name, Crusader. Naval architect Peter Duquesne occupied the dual roles of managing director and chief designer at boat builders Vosper. Prior to the Second World War, he had collaborated with Reed Railton in building Bluebird K4. After the war, their experience in converting K4 to jet power had made Duquesne and Vospers an obvious choice to build Crusader. With commitments in both the UK and US, Railton's role in Crusader's development was conducted from a distance. He maintained constant communication with Cobb and Duquesne via letter and telegram. At Vospers, Duquesne supervised an extensive test programme using both towed and rocket-powered models. Between them, Railton and Duquesne arrived at Crusader's final form. In post-war Britain, with many materials in short supply, Crusader was built mostly from birch plywood, with bulkheads bonded to a wooden keel. The whole structure was skinned in 1 16th inch ply and covered with doped fabric. Two substantial metal rings would provide extra strength for the engine mounts and also supported the cantilevered rear sponsons, which were themselves made from aluminium. Railton had proposed that a third metal ring should be installed ahead of the cockpit, with horizontal beams linking it to the rear ring bulkheads. This was intended to add strength to the area supporting the single front planing shoe. However, Crusader's final construction did not include these extra structural elements. Although it may not have been realised precisely as Railton had conceived it, Crusader was completed and presented to the press on the 22nd of August 1952, painted in a striking silver and red livery. The futuristic new record contender measured 31 feet long with a beam of 13 feet and weighed 6,300 pounds. So far, Cobb's water speed ambitions had cost him £15,000. Now, from England's south coast, it was time to head 600 miles north to the Scottish Highlands. Loch Ness is one of the largest bodies of water in Great Britain. Its relatively straight 23-mile length would provide John Cobb with the space he needed to run a boat at speeds never before attempted. As the Crusader team made the long journey to the village of Drumna Drocket on the northwestern shore of Loch Ness, many questions remained unanswered. Would the boat perform as Duquesne's models had suggested? Was Crusader's largely wooden construction up to the job? Clearly there were many days of testing ahead before a record attempt could be contemplated. At Temple Pier, de Havilland engineer John Lofty Bennett oversaw installation of the Ghost engine, which had been removed for transit. The radial jet turbine, more conventionally used to power the company's new Comet airliners, was fitted into Crusader's sleek tail section. From the side of the lock, a small boy watched as Crusader was lowered into the water by a giant crane. 
for six-year-old Richard Noble, seeing Cobb's futuristic jet-powered boat at Loch Ness was an inspiring sight that would result in a life led in pursuit of speed. Crusader's potential was apparent as soon as she took to the waters of Loch Ness at the end of August. Once up to speed and planing, water resistance fell away and the issue became one of controlling the boat's speed. However, in all but the calmest of conditions, Cobb experienced a rough ride. Describing his experience as like driving a London bus with flat tyres over cobblestones. Cobb made his first timed attempt on the 23rd of September. Although Crusader touched 200 miles per hour during the first run, the wind gusting across the lock made the boat unmanageable. In the days that followed, lower speed runs were used to trial a new rudder, while the team waited for the calm conditions they needed. Crusader underwent close inspection after each run, and it quickly became apparent that the front planing surface, although made from thick aluminium sheet, was becoming distorted as it impacted the surface of the lock. Repairs were made and remade, with wooden bracing fitted inside Crusader's hull. Railton suggested the fabrication and fitting of an internal aluminium structure to better support the front shoe, but Duquesne's preference was to return Crusader to Vospers for modifications, a round trip he estimated would take several weeks. Cobb decided to press on with the trials regardless. He was satisfied that the boat was behaving predictably, and could safely break Stanley Sayer's record of 178 miles per hour. Meetings between Cobb, Railton, Duquesne and project manager George Easton were fraught affairs as issues with the boat's structure and necessary repairs were discussed. Duquesne reportedly wrote a letter to Cobb, finishing with the terse statement, I understand you will accept responsibility for this course. Understanding that only high-speed tests would be conducted in his absence, Railton headed back to the US on business on the 28th of September. He would, he said, return the following month for the actual record attempt. It was not in John Cobb's nature to be impetuous. As the 29th of September dawned, with conditions on the lock again too rough to run Crusader, the team retired to the local hotel for breakfast. When they returned at 11am, the surface of the lock was a flat calm. In haste, the team dispensed with their usual briefing on the pier and prepared to take to the water. As Cobb climbed into Crusader's cockpit, a flare was fired to signal to all that the conditions were favourable. The ghost engine whined into life, and John Cobb headed out onto Loch Ness. Perhaps Cobb held the throttle open for just a little too long, or had misjudged the run-up to the mile. Maybe he felt he owed those watching the prospect of a new record. Whatever the reason, Crusader was travelling at around 240 miles per hour as she approached the timing markers. The support boats that rushed to the scene found Cobb floating 150 yards from the scene of the accident. As members of the team pulled his broken body from the waters of Loch Ness, their worst fears were realised. John Cobb, the gentle giant, was dead. Most of Crusader's wooden hull sank, weighed down by the engine. Floating debris was collected and taken ashore where it was burned at the request of Cobb's wife, who had witnessed the tragedy. Cobb's body was laid to rest in Esher, not far from Brooklands. After Cobb's funeral, Reed Railton returned to his home in Berkeley, California, where he spent hours running footage of Crusader's final run over and over, analysing each frame to try and understand what had caused the accident that had killed his friend. Despite what had happened, Railton was confident in his original design concept for Crusader. Further analysis was performed by Ken and Lou Norris, who were at the time designing Donald Campbell's new hydroplane, Bluebird K7. They concluded that Crusader had begun to pitch up and down rapidly towards the end of the measured mile, after hitting a series of waves, and that this movement had contributed to the collapse of the forward planing step. Crusader's final nosedive and disintegration had occurred in a fraction of a second. 
In 2002, Crusader's remains were located at the bottom of Loch Ness. Three years later, the wreck was designated a scheduled monument, protecting the site. Further underwater scans in 2019 showed more detail, but a conclusive reason for the loss of Crusader and her brave pilot is unlikely ever to be found 200 metres down in the murky waters of Loch Ness. Cobb's recorded average speed of 206 miles per hour was recognised as the fastest speed ever attained on water, despite his single run failing to qualify as an official world water speed record. At the side of the lock, local people dedicated a memorial to John Cobb, a gallant gentleman. In Drumna Drocket, on the banks of Loch Ness, John Cobb will never be forgotten. In 2018, former land speed record holder Richard Noble became aware that Reed Railton had built a model of what might have been Crusader's successor, further developing his design concept, although the project was later shelved. On learning that the model had been located and was for sale, a deal was done. Wouldn't it be interesting, he surmised, to use modern materials and technology to test Railton's design concept? Trials with the design Noble had christened Crusader II produced some interesting data and became the seed of the full-size Thrust WSH water speed project. And that, of course, is another story. Just a quick recommendation for two books that have been invaluable whilst researching this video. Carl Ludvigsen's Railton Man of Speed is an exhaustive account of Reed Railton's projects and technical achievements. Steve Holter's excellent book, Crusader, John Cobb's ill-fated quest for speed on water, provides a forensic look at Crusader, introducing newly discovered clues as to the cause of the crash, including the absence of the metal structures suggested by Reed Railton. I bought my own copies, and you'll find links in the video information. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to check out Scarf and Goggles channel for more tales of record breaking. Until next time.